Given Chuck's experience in the Navy, when the appointed hour came, he would be looking at his watch. And as the second hand swept past the hour, he would always be perplexed if things hadn't started yet. So in that spirit, we will uncharacteristically start with great punctuality. More volume or stand closer? Okay. Let's try this. Better? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Pippino. Everyone calls me Pip. Um, we are here today for a memorial for Professor Emeritus Charles Lewis Owen. It's also a celebration of an incredible life, a life so broad and so deep that we may never have the chance to know someone else who has lived such a life in our own lives. It's my staggering good fortune to have had the chance to know Chuck for more than 30 years, to work with him, to co-teach with him for about 10 years, and to, with humility, inherit his class when he retired. Today is also a chance to celebrate the life of Chuck's primary co-conspirator, Mary, who we will hear from later and we will hear about throughout the day. I'll start with a quick story about the beginning of one semester where Chuck was not feeling well. And before the first class, he was admitted to the hospital. So he wasn't there on the first day. And he, like all of us, chafed a bit at being in the hospital. Couldn't figure out how to get out. And he said, well, when class starts, send him my apologies and tell him I'll be along as soon as I can. So I did. And uh, I called him after the first class. And he said, uh, how did the class go? And I said, well, I, we got off to a good start. We missed you, though. But uh, we came up with an idea for getting you out of the hospital. And he said, oh, that's fantastic. What is it? And I said, well, the students suggested that we go to a costume shop and uh, rent a gorilla costume. And we'll bring it into the hospital in a trunk. Uh, you can change into the gorilla costume. The students and I will cause a diversion, and you can go down the fire escape. This was met with silence for a while. And then Chuck said, well, sounds like a pretty good class this year. <laughs> what time can I expect you? Chuck, my friend, you can expect us all now. We're all here, assembled in your honor, and we are ready to go. Good afternoon, and please allow me to welcome you all to the Institute of Design for a very special celebration of the life and legacy of one of our great academic leaders in our 82-year history, distinguished professor Chuck Owen. It's our great privilege for ID to host this memorial because Chuck had such a huge impact on our institution and to the many people who have studied and worked here. Chuck taught at ID for 45 years, from 1965 to 2010, and I calculated what percentage of the length of ID, so it's over 50% of ID's existence. So you can see the kind of impact if you are half the time of an institution here. Chuck's impact on ID was profound. He directed the product design program for more than 20 years, founded the design process laboratory, and worked and taught in the fields of design planning, computer supported design, design methodology, and design theory. He created the structure planning methodology, a rigorous system for solving exceedingly complex problems. He was a driving force behind our PhD program, 
All of those things you will hear in more detail for the speakers to come. Chuck was also a beloved teacher and mentor to generations of ID students. And I can attest to that not just from reports that I received as the dean, but also as a former student of Professor Owen. My project in the structure planning workshop that you can see in the exhibit on the back wall in 2000 was Eco Choices. We developed a system systemic solution for citizen scientists using sensors. This was in 2000, before the smartphone was invented. And what is so wonderful is that last year, last two years, Professor Carlos Teixeira did a project with Calumet City, funded by Kresge, that was actually about ten teenagers developing sensors to become resident scientists. So 20 years ahead, uh, Chuck's work led us to that. What I particularly value and believe made Jack one of the ideal professor for design was his focus on using design to amplify new emerging technology into better futures. And importantly, not as castles in the sky, but with inspiring and tangible designs and models, making it come to life and real. Chuck was not only a great professor and leader for ID, he was also a committed and recognized member of the university. And I'm pleased to introduce the provost of Illinois Tech, Peter Kilpatrick, to share more about his impact on the university. Thank you, Dennis. Um, it's my great honor uh, to be here today to celebrate the life of Chuck Owen. Unfortunately, sadly, I, I never had the opportunity to really get to know Chuck. Uh, he had retired from his position here at the university and and moved on to other things before I arrived here. But I've heard so much about Chuck that I, I really feel like I, I know him vicariously. Um, as Dennis mentioned, he was just an ideal professor. He, he served so many years uh, as a teacher, indeed, of generations of students, won teaching awards. In fact, he won so many awards, Alan said that the uh, awards committees asked him not to apply for awards anymore because he'd kind of broken the curve, and uh, they wanted to give other people a chance to win awards. Um, Chuck and Mary were really an ideal Illinois Tech couple. I know that, that for many, many decades, they've lived either on campus or very close to campus, and Mary now lives uh, across from Cunningham, and I, I told her when I chatted with her, I said, you know, we're renovating that corner of campus and she said she said yeah that's wonderful it's uh, it's really coming to life she says although I must admit I really enjoyed not having to worry about anyone in that dorm across the street looking into my house and I but I told her she could feel good about having Illinois Tech young men and women in there just close the drapes so um, they they really uh, represent what Illinois Tech's all about um, you know Chuck has awards named after him. He has a professorship named after him. And today we're really here to celebrate the totality of his life and his partnership with Mary. And it's my real honor to be here to help celebrate that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alan Cram, who, uh, our president, who knew him very well. Alan? Well, it's always good to have a provost give your speech first. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's amazing when I look out here and I see everyone here again for a, a service to remember uh, a great faculty, uh, how ID really penetrates across the world. I know that uh, Chuck had many students from all around the world. I know that uh, Korea and Japan were very popular destinations for students to come and work, to come to ID. And I think about universities and uh, how great faculty really define universities and Actually, ID wouldn't be ID without Chuck having been here. And it's an amazing thing to think that singular people actually make a difference that goes through time and will continue on through time. One of my roles uh, is, is to travel around this country and the world meeting with alumni, and I meet ID alumni everywhere. And uh, it's really interesting to meet ID alumni outside of the United States because they're all very successful. And they're all doing different things. Not, none of them are doing anything that you would say a designer would be doing this. No, they're, they're doing whatever they want to do and they're being successful at it because of the education and the training in ways of thinking that they actually learned under Chuck and the other faculty here at ID. 
It's also amazing to me uh, the number of ID uh, alumni who meet I meet who, after finishing work, are now full-time artists, whether it's in photography or painting or sculpting, etc. And and they show me their work, and then they show me what they did when they were here in school because they still have the pieces that they did while they were here working with the faculty, working with Chuck, etc. It's it's pretty amazing. But uh, all I can say is that ID is ID because of Chuck. It's because of other people also, but without Chuck, it wouldn't be what it is today. I'm, I'm sure Patrick might say something about that. Another person who uh, has a, a great uh, past and future with ID. But it, it really is a nice time to really reflect on the personality, the person, and the impact that one man can have on not just a college, but a school on Chicago and in the rest of the world. And I'm really pleased to be here to be able to uh, just say a few words about Chuck. And I also learned something since as I look around the room, I, I realize why none of you have ties on. I'm, I'm assuming that means you're all making quilts. <laughs> Thank you. When uh, Dennis and Pip asked me to say a few words about Chuck, I was honored and immediately said yes. And then it struck me I didn't know which Chuck Owen to talk about. Um, we all know him as a mentor, a friend. Some of us know him as family members. But I want to talk about eight Chuck Owens. Um, my first meeting with Chuck was when I was a graduate student at Cranbrook. Uh, like ID, a tiny school. Uh, that like ID has influence. And the the guest speaker who was there th that week was Chuck. And this is the deep Chuck. He was doing a Bucky Fuller imitation. He gave a talk that none of us understood, <laughs> that went on forever, and we were all sleepy. But, but we all knew it was important. We didn't know what the hell it was about, but we knew it was important. Then there's the tenacious Chuck. You're right, he, he made ID, and he saved it two or three times. Uh, the tenacious Chuck uh, once went with the acting chairman to meet with the provost at that time. I'll not name him. And he said, damn it, give me the textbook, and I'll teach design. You guys, don't, I can teach a class of 50 students. You don't need these classes of 20. And ID was on the brink of closing one of the times it was on the brink of closing. And um, Chuck went back and he decided to show everyone at, ID, at IIT what they could do. And that's when he decided to uh, enter the Japan Design Foundation competition. And he won it. And then the following year, he won it again, the following two years. And two years later, he won it a third time and then Kenji Akwan, a friend of the school, called Chuck and said, would you do me a favor and not enter anymore? We took that as a compliment and didn't enter anymore. That's a tenacious Chuck. The victorious Chuck, again, the Japan Design Foundation, the way he celebrated the students' work and the way he motivated the students was phenomenal. Um, he... Um, he put the school back, started to put the school back on the map. We had gone through some hard times and made sure that the then president knew that they had won it three times and changed the attitude of IIT towards ID. We all know about the fourth Chuck, the systems Chuck. We know of through structured planning and other things that he he did, uh, but he looked at the world as a systems. I remember an argument I had with him when we were planning a new graduate program. He came up with this crazy idea of doing classes that were seven weeks long. And what I saw with seven week long classes was twice as many starts and stops, which would be very inefficient. What he saw was the ability to bring in focused faculty 
who could teach things like cognitive human factors and cultural aspects of design that weren't tied to a studio class. Students would still make things, but they wouldn't make final polished artifacts. He was absolutely right. Whatever the cost was of starting and stopping twice as often, um, it, um, it gave us a flexibility that no other school had. Then there was the parsimonious Chuck. We traveled to um, around the world, really, uh, to Europe and Asia in planning the PhD program. And I remember on our first trip to Europe, Frankfurt was our first stop. And Chuck had booked the hotel rooms and put us in the middle of the red light district in Frankfurt. And he came down to breakfast the next day, and he was bedraggled looking. His bed had collapsed. So I said, Chuck, we're going to change hotels. And on the next trip, I took over the responsibility of booking the hotels. Got all the way up to Holiday Inns. Then there's the aesthete Chuck. He would get tears in his eyes talking about the beauty of shells, which we'll hear more about later, or talk about the lighting of restaurants, or I saw today the quilt that he made out of his uh, ties. There's the great host Chuck, where Chuck and Mary would bring us to their place in, the, in their home for wonderful occasions and talk about an amazing breadth of things. And then he also was behind the um, graduate seminar dinner um, where he didn't care, he, di he, did he didn't want to talk about design at that place, he wanted to talk about life. It was about mentoring the students. Then there's the visionary Chuck. He was crazy enough to think that computing would have something to do with design. He went through a decade of criticism from the design world where they couldn't imagine anything coming from this crude technology that could do the refined work that we were expected to do in design. But he didn't care that it didn't make sense that that day. He saw how it was going to make sense in the near future. And then I'm going to recycle. I'm going to go back to the deep chuck, the one I mentioned with the Bucky Fuller imitation at uh, Cranbrook. The deep chuck, one of his major insights wasn't to do with systems. It wasn't to do with technology. It was to do that the design field was a field of study defined by core principles of design, and it wasn't defined by its applications. He, he saw how the core of design could be applied to anything that touched humans. And he saw that the variations in the process and the domain knowledge you needed if you were designing for healthcare or if you were designing for consumer products or if you were designing for services, it was just a variation on the central theme of design. And uh, it's something that the field still hasn't caught on to enough. They, they keep thinking that this type of design is replacing the previous type of design. They're thinking of it as a fashion rather than something that can have some progress. And to me, that's one of the most endearing and, and important things that Chuck came up with. Uh, we will certainly all miss him, and, um, and the world will miss him. Thankfully, he wrote a lot, and I am sure that uh, that will become more important in the near future than it was during his life. Um, he didn't care what people thought about today. He was dedicated to what people would be doing to the next day or tomorrow. And uh, for that reason, we will all miss him deeply. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I don't think anyone would appreciate more than Chuck a taxonomy of Chucks. That was, uh, that was elegant and um, insightful. I'm going to give you three personal reflections about Chuck. Um, while I've been 
an adjunct faculty member here for 31 years, Jay Doblin started dragging me here to help him teach 38 years ago. And throughout my entire time, speaking very personally now, whenever I was here at ID and on stage, it would always be Chuck Owen more than anyone else sitting quietly in the back of the room that would come up to me afterwards and explain to me precisely what I screwed up. He would do it in the most constructive, gracious, generous, thoughtful way. I never felt anything other than lucky to be in his presence and grateful for the way he would raise my standards and tell me what I got wrong. It was emblematic of this pattern when I made a common mistake that fortunately is now beginning to diminish unless you're the President of the United States. And I made this mistake three decades ago when I was citing the, at that time, it was about this time of year, freakishly cold weather in Chicago and said, what, what, what do you make of this theory of global warming, Chuck, because there's this freakishly cold weather. And he looked at me the way he does, stared at me, reminding me of one of Jade Oblin's favorite expressions, you know, which is, ignorance this monumental is difficult to overcome. And, um, and all he said was, global warming. And, you know, with his eyes going up slightly with the word global. And, and in a hot second, I got it. And this was one of the greatest things that Chuck Owen did. He knew when he'd gotten through to you. He was just watching the light bulb, either dim or bright, over your head. And he knew when he got through, and he knew when he did his job as a truly gifted teacher. And he did that with me scores of times. So that's my first of three reflections, that even though I was never one of those people, President Cram, that paid you any tuition dollars. This is the man that made me a deeper thinker and a more appreciative student of the entire field of systems thinking. So that's the first reflection. The second one is about what Chuck did for the profession. You know, Inspired as he was by the extraordinary theoretical work of Chris Alexander, what he realized is that the dumbest way to simplify anything is to throw out all the hard parts. And more than anyone else, he said, we are going to grapple with the hard parts whenever it comes time to do anything that actually matters. And he did so relentlessly and over decades. He invented the one of only two systems to deal with the most complex design problems. The other one, of course, was invented in the former Soviet Union called TRIZ, T-R-I-Z. There's a reason why there are only two systems in the world to deal with the world's toughest design problems. The one that originated in the former Soviet countries, of course, originated because of a very interesting property of the former Soviet Union. If, in fact, you're the engineer of a bridge, with your engineering team, and that bridge ever falls down. Their habit in the former Soviet Union was to find the engineers, line them up against the rubble, and shoot them. So this created in the former Soviet Union a sort of hunger for robust methods of engineering. In this country, Chuck Owen did one voluntarily, not to save engineers from murderous officials, but rather because he actually thought it was important to solve gnarly problems elegantly. And of course, inspired by Christopher Alexander, he spent decades trying to figure out things like VT Con and Relayton, for which he needed heavy iron, and for which Mary ended up having to do the actual programming. Chuck was the wizard, many other people were able to follow in his wake and make a system that actually worked. And when I, when I talk about how that is a gift to the profession, already our provost and our president have acknowledged the many awards he won. Many people in this room are familiar with the fact that he did that in a way that embarrassed so many other global teams that we were sometimes politely asked not to enter a high-profile competition. 
But more than anyone else, what I saw was the ability to address and crack the toughest problems in a way that was workable, robust, and pragmatic. For years, I have been literally begging the Institute of Design to take seriously the ideas of aquitecture. To this day, I still think IIT would be better off if we actually built an architectural wonder out in Lake Michigan based entirely on ideas that he had 28 or 30 years ago and that were practical and achievable then and still haven't been put into practice. I've said we should call it the, um, the Global Center for, uh, for Sophisticated Innovation in Chicago and it should be powered by IIT and, and funded by Steelcase and Marriott and Hyatt and a few other organizations as a gift to the world centered here in Chicago and built entirely around the celebration of Chuck's methods. That's what he has done for the profession. He taught us to do stuff that matters and to be fearless about addressing the things that are complicated. And the last thing that I want to sort of point out is what he's done for this institution, the Institute of Design. You know, Jay Doblin did something spectacularly reckless when he applied to be the dean here. In speaking to Serge Shermayev and the widow of Laszlo maholy -Naj, um, Sybil maholy -Naj, they had, as I have heard the story, this was before my time, allotted four hours for his interview. And his flight from his beloved New York, where he had a very nice life, he thought he didn't really want to live in the backwater of Chicago. So he talked himself out of the job while on, on route to the interview. When he got to the interview, he said to the assembled board team, desperately looking for a replacement for the um, untimely passing of Laszlo maholy Naj, he said, uh, Look, there's 2,000 design schools in the world. 1,999 of them make things pretty for a living. You want to do something important, make things that work. Let's be the functionalist design school. If you're interested in that idea, you're interested in me. If you're not interested in that idea, you're not interested in me. And then he turned and left the room. Before his, you know, tiny hiney, Intersected with the door on the way out, Sybil maholy Naj was banging the table and said, we will hire that crass commercial hack over my dead body. And they continued the search for a dean for two more years, interviewing what I'm told was 89 other candidates, before finally saying, nope, nobody had an actual idea but that obnoxious Jay Doblin fellow. So Jay Doblin was the guy, you've been seeing photos here, thanks to Dan Chichester and others who've been doing such a lovely job of preparing this service. And one of the photos shows that era of the faculty. You know, the easy job was Jay Doblin's, declaring a big idea. You want to know what the hard job was? Doing any of it. And you want to know who the superstar was? Charles L. Owen. He's the guy that made us as an institution deep. And that's what I think we all share in our love of the Institute of Design, in our love of its history, its ambitions, and its continuous attempts to reinvent itself consistent with the way in which the world is changing. It's time to do that once again. We are living in an era where design is mainstreaming, but at the same time being made trivial with the kudzu of design thinking, okay? Here at the Institute of Design, what we do is we tackle at the highest, best ambitions, and the only reason we have a right to do that, the only reason we have the DNA to do that, and the only reason we now have the accumulated alumni, faculty, and fans to do that is directly because of Charles L. Owen, who listened to Jay Doblin's declarations and was crazy enough to deliver on the ambition. Those are the things that I think of when I think of my friend. I have no design training. I don't know why they allow me to teach here, okay? But I do know this. 
I'm here because of Chuck Owen. I'm here because the school raised up its ambition and he delivered the substance we needed more than anyone. So it is my great pleasure, Mary, to thank you for helping to make us deep in partnership with Chuck and for everyone in the room. So many friends, students, and faculty members that I think were lifted in this way, saw the power of it, and kept carrying the log a little further down the field. Thank you. All right, we're going to try an experiment, since Chuck would very much approve of an experiment. Uh, we will uh, ask four of Chuck's peers uh, to come and join us uh, in a panel discussion. And as they make their way to the front, and I make my way to the side, I will share a couple of thoughts. I'll share a couple of thoughts uh, that have been sent to us electronically in the last couple of weeks. Uh, from former ID student uh, Bob David, who uh, has a remarkable connection with the Golden Gate Bridge, you should check it out, um, considered Chuck to be the most significant educator in his life. Hugh Dubberly asks that we point out that Chuck pioneered the use of computers in design and established computing as a material in design. Jim Kindley suggests that we remember his role in bringing information science to the field of design. And he also observes that Chuck was in many ways the yin to Jay Doblin's Yang. And so, there are, of course, so many different ways of looking at the work Chuck did. Can you grab that second microphone there? That's just All right, um, just a couple of questions, but if we could start, please, uh, if you would each introduce yourselves. Go ahead, Sharon. Hi, Chris Conley. Uh, graduated in 94, spent probably six or seven years here, both uh, in the foundation program and then the Master of Science with Chuck. Vijay Kumar. Um, I've been teaching at ID as a full-time professor since 2002, and a couple of months back, a few months back, I retired. <laughs> so I'm Professor Emeritus here. Before uh, teaching at ID, I was working with Larry and Pip and the team at Doblin for almost 12 years. Sharon Pogginpol. Uh I have a deep history with this place. Uh, let's see, 65 I received uh, undergraduate degree, 74 was a master's degree, uh, I had started teaching, I left, I was back, <laughs> it, it gets into your bloodstream and it's difficult uh, not to participate. Um, taught here for quite a few years. I'm Keiichi Sato. Um, first, I came here in 1977. And I have to say, actually, it was a second master degree and took five years. <laughs> it was a sort of average norm, actually, that time. And 
And then I joined um, the faculty at 82, and I just escaped a little bit uh, for, I think, eight or nine years uh, in 90s uh, to Japan, but I came back. I don't know why, but this, I, <laughs> I came back here again. And uh, last year, finally, I retired. Uh, and so I still I'm uh, associated with uh, IIT as the emeritus active, uh, just carrying some research project at IIT. Fabulous. Uh, since you have the microphone, Kay, uh, you can be respondent number one. Oh. <laughs> okay. So our first question, um, what do you see as Chuck's contributions to the discipline of design? Well, it's not hard to say first. Uh, first thing, actually, he established the discipline of design research or design uh, the methodology. One of very few actually the design methodologists actually really, uh, developed uh, the, the first phase, second phase, third phase, till actually he you know, stopped last year. Uh, he, he continued to actually develop uh, the dis design methodologist uh, discipline or design research discipline in general. And I, uh, going back, uh, a little bit about uh, the history of uh, design research. Actually, 1960s, uh, the mid 60s. Uh, if if I'm wrong, Mary, uh, let me know. <laughs> I think around uh, well, mid 60s. Actually, he started the first uh, design research uh, work, and uh, 68 uh, the, he published a book, uh, the paper uh, called Decomposition. That's the uh, the foundation for his uh, re, uh, the sys, uh, structured planning, and published uh, later uh, as a part of uh, MIT Press book called uh, "Emerging uh, Method of uh, Emerging Method of uh, Environmental Design and Planning," and that book and Chuck's work uh, became a really seminal uh, work uh, in design methodology. And late, much much later, I found that the book and that paper actually attracted me to come over here uh, in 77. And the attempt that time uh, was to remodel the design problem, not as a, a quantitative problem like in engineering, uh, really uh, try to uh, model and describe the qualitative nature of design problems. And so that still we face and we challenge uh, the same topic, but uh, he started this uh, design research discipline. So that's the, the one big uh, the contribution. And an other educator actually is, is forgetting structured planning. Actually, everybody talk about computer application, the structured planning. I think he established a sort of a, uh, the system, systematic approach in design and the mental model of the designer to deal with the complex issues. So without using his programs, you, without using um, structured planning procedures, still he actually influenced the really whole discipline to actually incorporate more rigorous uh, frameworks and mental models for designers. <laughs> Take a shot at it, Sharon. Okay, why not? When I was a graduate student, uh, this would have been maybe 1970. I was invited by Chuck. Uh, more, more, yeah. I don't like microphones. Do I really need one? I don't, I don't think so. Anyway, um, 1970, I was invited by Chuck to participate uh, in a summer program to redesign the Institute of Design as a physical building. 
And of course, we used his structured plans and we used the whole methodological package that he had at that time. Uh, and it was a, a fascinating experience to look very broadly at what was known about uh, architectural methods, uh, what kinds of space planning might occur. And of course, I see you have a new building, uh, and I'm hearing it's not very functional. Uh, so there we are. Um, we, we developed uh, models. Uh, we photographed them. Uh, we made a, a very gigantic presentation. Uh, ever hopeful that IIT would look with favor on what we were doing. Um, but like so many projects that were deep and broad, uh, nothing came of it. And I think Chuck's methodology continues to have a power that is unrealized. Uh, and it's unrealized because uh, the problems that we're dealing with uh, tend to be trivial. And we have the opportunity or the desire, perhaps, as designers uh, to work more broadly, uh, to work more in depth, to synthesize information in ways that Chuck's methodology supports. Uh, and to be creative and come up with solutions uh, that may escape more casual looks. Um, but it's hard because of the commitment that's necessary uh, to invest in the methodology and to understand its power and to generate things uh, that may be inconceivable without such a methodology. <coughs> Chuck's uh, impact on the field of design, right? Um, <clears throat> at a very high level, I would, I would say um, <clears throat> he reframed <laughs> the whole field of design um, 40 years ago. He caused and facilitated that reframing. Specifically, I can think about three ways in which he did that. One was the transition from appearance-focused design to performance-focused design. Design was appearance-focused at that time. He really tra you know, trans transformed the entire thinking. That's, that's why he used terms like functional structure and design factors and speculations and solution elements, all part of his vocabulary that he created by which he could trans, transform the whole thinking from appearance-based to performance-based. Secondly, um, from an intuition-based approach to a structured, systemic, rigorous approach, right? You, you all know structure, structure planning for how rigorous and how deeply involved that is beyond an intuition that an individual might have. I barely need it for complex problems like what we have today. Third, from a focus on products or one thing to a focus on the whole system, right? He taught us that. Don't focus on just one thing that you're trying to solve, design for. That is only part of a larger system. There are products and manufacturers and users and you know, um, distributors and channels and governments and regulation, all part of the system, of ecosystem. Right? So you need to understand that that was a massive transformation that he brought about. This is all part of his, you know, I, I think of this is all part of his thought leadership that he brought to the table in reframing the field. But not only that, he had this amazing capacity to sort of complement his thought leadership with practice leadership, right? Practicing, walking the talk, right? 
that's where he developed the detailed methodologies and templates and you know, especially with, um, with the help of Mary, the relation and VDCon program that anyone could, anyone could use, and he made it real and practical and taught them at ID, and you know, it became so, so prevalent. So thought leadership and practice leadership, and he's a true leader who sort of fused these two together and made a massive impact on the world. I think these are all <clears throat> different ways of saying the same thing about Chuck's massive influence on design. I think it's easy to talk about the complexity that his systems can deal with or his uh, design methodologies can deal with. But I, I go down to the fundamentals and that is he gave design kind of the permission, the expectation that it could be studied, not just practiced. That you could reflect on why it might work in ways that other disciplines can't make problem solving work that way, or how does, how does it work? So I think that permission led to the PhD, the first PhD in design, um, and that has obviously spawned a whole uh, number of schools that now study design, why does it work, what, how does it exist, and of course it, it's advanced the practical field, the professional field, by having very specific kinds of design, not one kind of design, you know, it's very easy for all of us to fall into that trap of saying, what is design today? But design is actually many things, just like the engineering field is many things, or the social sciences have many different disciplines within it. Chuck helps start that in design. And then it, in respect to structured planning, for me, you know, we all can't practice the full structured planning on our, every project we do, but the fundamentals of it that he laid, the specification and the clarification of the types of information, the kind of thinking you do that goes into the design process is what he clarified. So these things like what are the modes of a system? And what are underneath those modes? What are the activities? And what are under the activities but the functions? I think he saw the whole world as some sort of hierarchy, obviously. Uh, Semi-lattice, not just a simple lattice, of course. Um, so he, that, the, clarity, the clarity of that language is very powerful. And Kim Irwin and I were discussing beforehand that she's teaching today and often, and with surprise, has to, one of the main things that students take away from her teaching is the clarity she brings to what you're talking about when you're talking about a particular topic. Are we, you know, are we talking about the facts here or the way it behaves or the dynamics of it? And that clarity which is so important in problem solving, is something that Chuck laid out in structured planning. And that's why we all learned most of our grammar in structured planning and not in grade school, because now we know what a gerund is for, it's for specifying activities. It has an ING form. We learned that from Chuck. Um, and then I think Chuck also, and this is probably is more personal, but he brought mathematics to design. Of course, he has the programs of relation in VTCon. But in the class, when I took structured planning from him, and he was explaining the math of how he relates the functions into a semi-lattice. You know, he was using algebra and figured out how to use algebra to get it to do what he wanted to do. And I pulled him aside and said, how did you, you're not a mathematician, how did you figure out those equations? Like, I was a young, you know, I, I was an engineer already. Mm -hmm. I went to the undergraduate engineering program, but I didn't understand the use of mathematics like that. And he said, I just, well, I made it do what I wanted it, what, it, what needed to be done. He used math as a design tool to make those things work in order to get math into problem solving or design problem solving. So these things of clarity and the use of, you know, knowledge to design with and different kinds of, difference, different kinds of disciplines to design with is something he brought to the field. Well done, my friends. You can hold the microphone for a minute <laughs> because you're on a roll. Um, the, the second and briefer question is, what impact did Chuck have on your life? A really big one. <laughs> uh, briefly, yeah, I think the clarity of thinking um, 
and approaching the front end of design problem solving in a little bit more rigorous way. Uh, I built a whole firm and I continue to practice today on that. Um, helping my clients see the problem or the opportunity or the challenge they're facing with more clarity. And if you can do that, the problem solving actually becomes easier. It's the definition of the problem that uh, is often kind of quickly passed over before people want to have ideas. Well, that clarity of problem solving, I think, is what Chuck brought to me. <laughs> yep, Thanks. got it. Um, <clears throat> ever since I met Chuck in 1987 onwards, um, <clears throat> the experience that I had with him was simply life-changing for me. Simply life-changing. <coughs> um, <in clears throat> when I, whenever I give talks or seminars, I use um, uh, three or four introductory slides to tell, introduce myself. One of the slides is specifically about Chuck, how I got in touch with him when I was exploring back in India about the newest things that are happening in the design field, especially computer-supported design processes. I came across Chuck's papers. I read them. I got fascinated by them. I started typing letters, the typewriter, not email at that time, typing letters and mailing to Chuck and waiting for almost three or four weeks to get his response back. And that was a kind of rapport that I established with him. And finally, I was lucky that he invited me to ID to be a student under him. He, I was lucky to, be, to, to have him as my advisor and my mentor, for lifetime advisor and mentor, I would say. Um, <clears throat> then um, <clears throat> the, the thesis project that I did under Chuck's advice at that time itself was interesting. Uh, it's a f it's it's an it's an, a field called dynamic diagramming. Uh, it's a dynamic visualization of data. It's it's a competency that is being less talked about when we talk about Chuck, but that was uh, something that is of great interest to him. So I got fascinated by that topic and I selected that topic as my thesis project: dynamic diagramming, how to visualize information in dynamic, interactive ways, so that you can use it for analysis and see patterns and make decisions correctly. So we wrote papers and I had in terrific interactions with him and we wrote papers together and I, in fact, created a fantastic demonstration showing fun some of the fundamentals of dynamic diagramming operations. Those are, those are the kinds of impact that I had early on. And as I moved on, um, <coughs> moved on to my own activities at Dublin and teaching, one of the mottos that I took, I never shared that with you, Pip. One of the silent mottos that I had was, be like Chuck. <laughs> it is a, the silent motto is, is a, sort of, it is a driving principle for me. Uh, more specifically, think like Chuck, right? I use that principle. And all the principles that I learned from Chuck in, in my entire work for, going forward, um, the kind of leadership that I was able to establish in the field of design methods and innovation frameworks, all driven fundamentally by that think like Chuck approach. And not only that, uh, the kind of projects that I could, I could do to demonstrate the value of that methodology. Chuck's advice, Chuck always used to tell us that if you have a very powerful process to solve problems. It can be applied to anything. It need not be a product design project. It need not be a service design project. So that's what I was practicing as a result of how he affected me. I did product design projects for companies and uh, non-profit organizations working with them on community-related projects, social innovation projects, and more recently um, at, at government level, policy decision projects and po policy making projects. So that itself is, uh, to me, is a testament to the kind of principle that I learned from Chuck so that I could, I could have that broad application on projects. And lastly, one small thing that I want to say, the, the, the word conversations. The conversation that I 
could have with Chuck was delightful experiences. Just, just delightful experiences, right? Any conversation that you'll have with it, he will take you through a journey through his mind, how he connected dots, how he can see relationships, how he can see the network working, how he can see opportunities for innovation. That is amazing, that kind of conversation, right? And especially when Mary was part of that conversation, it is doubly delightful, <laughs> right? Um, but of course, I miss those kinds of conversations, even as I strive to continue to think like Chuck. Connecting the dots. Yes, he was superb at connecting the dots. The dots between science uh, and creativity, uh, identifying where the create, creative opportunity was, uh, connecting things from the social sciences uh, as well as uh, those more technical aspects that one needed to consider. Uh, he was so able to connect the dots and have fun with the connections. Uh, sometimes a little bit surprising, sometimes a little bit crazy, uh, but always on point uh, with the dots. Uh, the synthesis of information, uh, the system that he provided uh, was really remarkable uh, and could lead to so much good, thoughtful, surprising work. Um, well, I switched uh, because of his paper I changed my discipline from engineering to design. Um, so that's the problem. Most personal is uh, significant <laughs> impact <laughs> anyway. Um, but I, I think it, just looking at uh, what Chuck did, or maybe I think indirectly or directly told, him, told me uh, to do is think big. <laughs> and be the first. So ID had a design methodology probably that, that the course, the first in the world probably uh, called design methodology or you know, uh, the structured learning and so. And uh, computer graphics, computer application, probably the first design school you know, you know, you know, systematically consist uh, consistently applied the new technology to design. And everything, he tried to make it big. And if you do the, something, then make significant. So he started applying to the comp you know, comp competitions and papers. If we write a paper, get the best paper award. And <laughs> a competition, get the grand prize. So. You know, 90s particularly, we started getting at many prizes and, uh, you know, in, you know, academics and in, in, uh, practice competitions and so on. So that is a major impact, not only per, just my personal experience that impact left to ID. And first to be a new, you know, uh, this, you know, uh, the new educational approaches, new way of thinking, and so on. So that's that how actually I learned uh, to continue uh, my uh, the career as a design researcher, practitioner. Well, I, I've been very much on the practice side, but uh, that's that how actually I, I learned, and that shaped my life. Well done, all. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Way to go. All right, once again, we're going to switch formats. Uh, we asked, we encouraged people, uh, if they had the capacity, 
uh, to produce a video if they could not be here. Uh, a remarkable one has come our way. Ah, yes. <laughs> um, it's emotional in places. It's really great. Here we go. It is a sad and touching moment to have the honor of reflecting back on my friend and mentor, Chuck. I still remember the day vividly when I first met Chuck at Crown Hall in mid-August 1982. Chuck warmly welcomed me and told me about courses that I had never heard of, like Grotrain, Computer-Aided Design, Design Methodology, and System Design. Naturally, the following semester was a nightmare for me, having been trained in Art-Oriented Design School. I was so lucky to be part of a House of Future project, grand prize winning project at the first Osaka International Design Competitions. And it completely transformed my point of view on design. During the years long period of my study at ID, Chuck opened up a whole new horizon of design for me with a systematic design thinking academic attitude, and design research, which have made me what I am today. This impact was limited to me, but influenced my country too. When I returned to Korea in 1985, the Korean design community was beginning to realize the importance of systematic design. And thanks to his teaching, I made a significant contribution to forming foundation of systematic design design methodology, design research in design. In the old days, with the emergence of computers in design, his pioneering work on the application of computers to highly complex, non-visual problems was far more innovative than any others, who focused merely on using computer as a visual tool. Even today, his pioneering leadership gives us a lot of information for how to handle the new technologies of AI and big data. The DPL newsletter he published was not just a simple newsletter, but also a knowledge sharing platform filled with research papers, essays, like academic journals. He also contributed significantly to establishing design research as a legitimate discipline creating the first design PhD program at ID in the United States. When I have been confronted with critical turning points in my life, he was always with me, guiding me to make right choices and sharing joys and sorrows. When I became vice president of LG, the president of ISDR, the honorable fellow of DRS, Dean of School of Design, Hong Kong Polytech University. The first person I thought was him. And I was so proud of myself for having been his student. Chuck was not just a teacher to me, but also the perfect friend to have led me to the joy of food and drink of martini and beer. The old I'm getting, the deep his love guests. Fortunately, I had a lot of him met as my son in his home on Michigan Avenue last March. Sadly, I did not realize it would be the farewell lunch. Yes, it is sad indeed to lose Chuck, but luckily, still to have Mary with us, may Chuck rest in peace.
Pretty great, huh? Um, Chung Cho, it's the middle of the night in Hong Kong, I know very well. Uh, when you have a chance to watch this, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. And what better way to again switch topics than to go from that delightful video to the world of shells? I'm, oh, I should probably talk into this thing. I'm Jochen Gerber. I'm uh, at the Field Museum, but um, I knew Chuck as a friend and fellow uh, Chicago Shell Club member for the last 20 years. Some of you may know that uh, Chuck was an avid amateur uh, conchologist. A conchologist is somebody who studies shells. Um, and it turned out, after we knew uh, each other for a while, that we also were neighbors. We only lived about a block from each other along Michigan Avenue. Unlike uh, many shell enthusiasts, Chuck's, uh, Chuck didn't catch the shell bug as a kid picking up shells on some beach. His interest in shells was sparked uh, in the fully grown man by the 1969 National Geographic article, The Magic Lure, The Magic Lure of Seashells. In the same year, he and Mary and a gaggle of their relatives headed to Florida to watch the moon launch of uh, Apollo 11. After the launch, the group uh, spent time on Sanibel Island, which is often called uh, the world capital of shell collecting. There's some of that. And indeed, as you can see here, the beaches are littered with millions of shells. Chuck and Mary conducted a thorough survey, and that was it. They were hooked. They joined the Chicago Shell Club in 1970, over the years, both of them held a variety of shell club offices, including Chuck serving as president for a number of years, as co-editors of Thatcheria, the shell club's newsletter. They not only greatly improved on appearance and content, but also contributed uh, many articles. Among them was Chuck's highly sophisticated evaluating dealers and deals. And from all what I heard, before what comes now should look familiar to all of you. So that's <laughs> evaluating dealers and deals. Although the owns collected shells themselves when they could, uh, there are many desirable species that are hard or impossible to self-collect. Specialized shell dealers allow the fulfillment of many a collector's dreams However, the physical quality of the shells delivered, the data accompanying them, because you want to know where they come from and when they were collected, uh, and their price vary widely from dealer to dealer. Chuck's article devised a method to objectively compare the quality of shell dealers and their merchandise. It was complex, used lots of math, and went certainly right over most readers' heads. I actually doubt that anybody ever applied the method besides <laughs> maybe Chuck himself. It goes to show, though, how thorough and methodical a man Chuck was. But as I said, uh, Chuck and Mary didn't rely solely on dealers. They sought opportunities to observe and collect marine mollusks, the creators of seashells, in their habitat. They took up scuba diving and traveled to far-flung places such as Fiji and Baja, California. Uh, this is uh, Chuck trying to get a good shot of some live cone shells in Baja. In later years, they made a, it a tradition to visit the conventions of the Conchologists of America, which are held annually in different cities around the country. They usually drove 
planned the route meticulously, scouting out stops for shell hunting and the best restaurants al along the way. So over the years, Chuck and Mary assembled an excellent and well-documented shell collection of about 10,000 specimens. And in addition, Chuck, always the scholar, amassed a library of more than a thousand books on shell and marine life uh, to go with it, because he did not just want to own and look at the shells, he wanted to know all about them. Chuck, of course, saw in shells, too, that form follows function, but I don't think that shells would have cast their spell on him as they did, if that was all. What fascinated him in shells, I think, was the combination of functional design with that other dimension, beauty, whose utilitarian purpose, if there is one, remains hidden to us. Thank you. I have not often been able to speak to such a distinguished quarrel. And I want to tell you that as a little brother, it's awfully good to see you, see you again. I've taught this, taught a couple of you, but mostly I'm very proud of what Chuck has done. And I'm not always sure that you are aware of the effect that you had on Chuck. Uh, he loved his faculty, his students, talked about them all the time. And in fact, that's what I think kept him going so long, uh, was all of the things that he saw in you guys and heard from you guys. He's had students who have come across the big pond to say hello to him. There's one, and I can't even remember who it was, I'm sorry to say, who always sent him flowers <laughs> and candy on his birthday. It's pretty special, but not close enough. Okay. <laughs> sorry, folks. I uh, originally started to think about this as I will tell you of two vignettes from long time ago. Chuck and I in our grade school, um, I was Chuck's little brother. In fact, I've always been Chuck's little brother. Um, he had a way, well, first of all, he was a foot and a half taller than me, or about four years difference in age. And we had a park in our neighborhood Chuck being sort of a serious guy and easy to get along with, and I was maybe a little bit more of a, a big mouth, if you will. I could get myself in trouble real easily at the age of six, seven, and eight, and who would come to my rescue? And then I, of course, would go home while he was fending off whoever was working on me. And I lived in a second floor apartment in Skokie, and I could hear him coming up the stairs. Where is that goddamn who ran off? <laughs> but over the years, Chuck and I developed an awfully close uh, relationship. Uh, he was a thinker and I was a doer. Uh, I went into engineering, and of course he went into design after wasting all that time in chemistry. Never did understand that. We had a theory 
Dad bought us a Gilbert chemistry set. Had to be in the 43, 44, 45 range, somewhere in there. And at that time, you could buy potassium nitrate at the drugstore, which is <laughs> insane now. But, uh, and of course, Chuck, uh, we got a Gilbert chemistry set. In it was a, two and a half mil, 250 mil beaker, which we filled with sulfur, charcoal, and potassium nitrate. It's a wonderful, wonderful situation. We had a table in our bedroom, a couple of chairs on it. And Chuck set the beaker down, took a spoon out of the chemistry set, put a spoonful of our mixture, and held it over a candle. And a <laughs> this was before we were a little bit more sophisticated. And uh, of course, the, the stuff ignited, sparks went into the beaker, and the whole beaker went up. And as mom came charging into the bedroom, all we could see was a, about a layer of white, thick smoke on the ceiling all the way around. And the chemistry set within a day disappeared. I don't know where it went. We never did. <laughs> Chuck then went into the Navy and did a great job in the Navy. Uh, he taught at Bainbridge, taught uh, math, science, um, and a few other things. Uh, and then feeling, uh, apparently, I don't know whether he ever felt guilty or not, but he decided he better go to state. So he applied and was uh, uh, made the uh, engineering officer on a destroyer, the Mansfield. Uh, and this would be in the 60s. Um, when he came back, he fell in love with a sailboat out in Malibu, which is called the Malibu Outrigger. It's actually, uh, people look at it as, as a twin hull, but it's really a main hull and, a, and an outrigger, and a latine rig, if you're familiar with any sails. But that may have been one, and I have to be careful because Mary's here, one of the happiest points of his life. <laughs> he. Uh, he was always happiest designing something, in spite of the Navy. But, uh, uh, and then I was with him and we would manufacture whatever it was. Well, he bought a sailboat out there and we went out with a Corvair and dragged it back to Chicago, took it up to Wisconsin, and spent about a year, almost a year and a half, finishing the boat, because we bought it just rough, uh, roughly put together. And during that time period, Chuck designed all of the aspects that you could design. The basic boat was framed. And uh, then we built each and every bit. But he was so happy. He enjoyed that so much. And I've got all these drawings and things of deck plates and you name it that uh, should have gone with a sailboat when we sold it, but it didn't. Anyhow, um, we're going to miss him a lot, and we do now. But one of the things <clears throat> that I'm not sure that you guys understand is the importance that you had on his life. And you talk about what he did with you and for you and so on and so forth. But it was a two-way street. Chuck absolutely adored you guys. And it made his, it made his career. That's all I have. Thank you.
Chuck today. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our life together. Oh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our life together. Uh, but first, I've got to say just one thing. Living with Chuck for, well, for 50, 51 years when we were married, and uh, we went together for about two years before that, has been an adventure that not many people can really have. It's, we always uh, did things together. We, um, and so we were very close. We had, uh, we've lived here uh, near IIT for all the 51 years. And uh, we, we met through a fortunate uh, experience for me and for him too, I guess. We, we went, we, we, um, uh, he, he worked, taught at IIT and I worked at ITRI. And at that time, IIT was using the ITRI computer and sometimes having trouble with it. And so Chuck would come to our help desk and uh, they, they couldn't help him. He, he was trying to run, you've heard uh, Alexander's name mentioned here today. He was trying to run a group of machine language cards that were uh, that weren't running, and so he'd come ask our help desk what was going on, and they could they could not uh, help him. Well, my boss was a friend of Chuck's, and he uh, said, "Well, I'll I'll take you to someone to help you." I was working on a special project at the time, and so he came back to the Univac 1108 computer, which was a, a great computer. It looked like computers look when they're in the movies. You know, lots of tapes spinning and big. It was a vacuum tube, and ITRI ran it uh, 24 hours a day because they were processing the 1960 census, I believe. And um, anyway, he came back in the hall there, and I was working in a sort of private office. And Smokey asked me if I could if I could help him. I said, well, I think maybe I can, because I had had experience, a lot of experience with Fortran. And um, so I did help him in about a day and a half. And he kept coming back to see me after that. I think we were both attracted to each other. And, and uh, we're, we were in our 30s. So that was, uh, it was, you know, we sort of were casual and then friendly. Uh, he went to Purdue for his undergraduate degree. And I, I, I was a Notre Dame fan, because I'm a Chicago South Sider. And, uh, and we uh, made a bet on the Purdue Notre Dame game. And I won. And so it was a bottle of scotch. And I thought, well, I really should invite him over to have a drink. I lived at Prairie Shores at the time. And uh, so he came over and had a drink. And then we watched uh, uh, subsequent games and started going out together. And that was uh, the beginning of a beautiful life. Um, we also went to the University of Chicago together uh, to, in, in the program of uh, uh, Committee on Information Science. That's what they had at the time. It was 1967. Ni yeah, 1967, I think. And uh, we had been out with um, uh, a friend of his from the Navy. He was in the Navy also for her. He was in the Navy for five years. I think he, he re-upped so he could be an engineer. Is that in the exhibit? Yes, yeah, his Navy life. And he, uh, and one of his friends from the uh, officer's galley came to Chicago to visit, and we went out with Don and Bruce, and we drank stingers all night. And I don't know if any of you drink stingers, but 
that picture the next day of registration at the U of C was uh, the most beautiful picture I've ever taken. I was so hungover. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, we got married in, in 68, uh, four months after Dot and Carol got married. We've always been really close with our family. We, we, uh, uh, have a, we shared a uh, cottage, really, in Powers Lake, a small little house. And every weekend in the summer, we'd be up there, uh, sort of. And Chuck would spend summer up there with his mother. And I would go back and forth from, I think I was working at either Leo Burnett or Itri at the time, or IIT. I also worked at IIT. And we, at the U of C, they let us, uh, we, we were taking, we were in the same program, and they let me take a course by just doing all the, all the assignments, and Chuck went to class, and then we discussed it. It was linear algebra, it was a prerequisite for some of the courses we had to take. Uh, we also worked at Unimark. I, freelance for them at uh, a DPG design planning group, which Jay was the, an advisor for, I believe. Dale was a vice president. Richard Vanham was president. That was when Water Tower Place was being designed. And uh, uh, Dale was working with, uh, in the design of the shopping center at Water Tower Place. What I did for them was I studied the, um, uh, I can't think what it is, the population around there, who would be shopping at Water Tower Place. I did not program for them. But it was, it was a fun place to work. And Chuck was a consultant to them, too. He, Jay always brought in Chuck to be a consultant. And I don't know if you all know who Jay Doblin was. He was director of the, of the uh, Institute of Design for many years. And uh, he was a wonderful man. We both worked, uh, and I also worked for Peter Lykos at IIT. He, he was the computer science guy. Then there's the restaurant. Ch Chuck is famous for being a... a real fan of good restaurants. So our life consisted uh, many times of going to, we, we tried every new restaurant in Chicago and uh, we really enjoyed it. And one of the ways, when we joined COA, which is kind of Colleges of America, uh, we started going in 1988. We joined, well, that may be when we joined them. And we, would, the way we would go, if it was in the United States, is Chuck would pick out, we, we would look at our route and what city we were going to, and he would pick out restaurants in the various cities we were going to pass through or, or go to all around the United States. And I would use Expedia to look at hotels that were within easy access to those restaurants. Then we'd, we'd uh, make an itinerary uh, very systematic. I wish I had a copy of it here to show you. <laughs> but Don and Carol know. We would make an itinerary and show, uh, and send even to our relatives to show them where we were going. It, the itinerary included mileage, times, everything. Uh, we, took, we took, we have 19 nieces and nephews. And we took them in groups at, at around the age of sometimes between 11 and 13. We took them in groups to learn how to snorkel. And um, we always would take their grandmothers along. And it was really fun to watch these families in action and, and have them snorkeling. It was really terrific. Uh, and we spent, Chuck spent the summers at the lake, Powers Lake, with his mother, and I would go out there by train, so I was like a suburbanite, a commuting suburbanite for a year and a half. 
or for all those years. We lived there, Chuck and I lived there uh, when we were transferring from South Commons to uh, Michigan Place where we live now. And uh, we would come into IIT on Tuesday, stay in Gonzales Hall, we rented an apartment in Gonzales Hall, and then go back on Friday, go back to the lake. And uh, that worked out pretty well. Uh, we, we have traveled all our lives, uh, many times with people from the Institute of Design. Uh, we, Mary and Jim Montague were our best friends. They're, they live in, a, Jim was a uh, acting director of the Institute of Design. He left in 79, I think, and they went to live in Australia permanently in 1981. We visited them many, many times, and they were they were our best friends in Chicago, and our best friends um, in Australia. Uh, we we went on many many trips in Australia with them. Uh, one the first one it was in 1981, and it was. Uh, uh, we, we, it was, we were gone for a month. I was working at Leo Burnett then, and, and they uh, let me go for a month. And, and uh, we did everything. Uh, we visited we visited Jim and Mary, went out in the, uh, beyond the stump in the outback, uh, went to Melbourne and uh, Canberra, and then we visited them in 1995. Uh, where we went to a rainforest, and at this rainforest, um, uh, Chuck would always get up early in the morning. And that is something I don't like to do. So in all the trips, he would get up early, and and we he would go out looking for land shells. And um, one day he came back, and Jim has a TV of this, and. He, uh, a kangaroo was following Chuck. It, it was right at his shoulder, just just as where I would be if I were following Chuck. Uh, we vi visited New Zealand on some of those Australian ships, and one time we visited uh, Charles Vizera, who gave the talk at Chuck's memorial uh, in New Zealand. He was in in New Zealand at the time. And we learned a lot about uh, uh, albatross, which is a fascinating story, I'm not gonna tell you. And Chuck, Charles Bizarro cooked the best salmon that Chuck had ever had. He wanted, he, he wanted it, and he tried salmon. He, he, he ate salmon all the time. But Charles, it was so fresh, you know, New Zealand, and uh, so, so well cooked that Chuck really wanted to have that salmon again. Um, we vacationed with John and Pam Heske uh, in the uh, in Chile, and I think that uh, Pat and Cheryl were there then too. They didn't come to the Atacama Desert with us, which is really interesting. We and uh, we also vacationed with them in, in Britain in Cornwall. Uh, for those of you who don't know John, he was British, and he cooked for us typical English drinks. It was, I mean, typical English meals. It was terrific. And then we went with Dale and Connie to to uh, uh, Mexico one time, Yucatan Peninsula, where we met, we went to Coba and met them in Coba. We. Vacation with Sharon and Rex, uh, skiing in Colorado, which we learned how to uh, cross-country ski and had a wonderful time. Uh, two other design people from were in Australia, Vesna Popovich and Rich Coker, and Warren Kumpf, who was one of the first, one of the students in Chuck's first uh, structured planning Thing, I think worked for Herman Miller, so we did a lot of consulting work for Herman Miller, also. 
and um, Rich Coker. Oh, we had a travel all for 15 years. We were going to go to Baja, and I don't know if you know what an international harvester travel all is like. It's built on a truck, truck chassis, a huge cart. I used to drive that to Treasure Island in Old Town uh, and get, go in that little parking lot and be really frightened that I was going to scrape at one of those expensive cars that were in that garage. Um, in Pat, we traveled with Pat to Paris, and then we have Koshan and Kung Pio. And uh, Kung Pio is a really good friend. Visiting him in Korea is, was absolutely wonderful. And Koshan is from Taiwan. Now we've been to, we were at, in Taiwan probably, uh, I, I, I was there probably five times. Chuck was there uh, in 1957, before a lot of anybody was born there. You know, they, at, at that time he was there, and he always would say to the, the, uh, the uh, Taiwanese, uh, oh, I was here in 57. That's when he was in the Navy. And that's, that was really funny, because I wasn't even born then, but they were taking us around. Taiwan is absolutely a beautiful island. Koshan would always plan, he would invite Chuck to give a talk, and he would always plan a, a, a holiday for us. So we saw the whole island in the times we were visiting there. I think they have the freshest food because there's no, no importing or anything. They grow it and they eat it. It's really wonderful. And then we traveled with Kay and his family to to uh, to Sanibel Island with the, his little kids. I had never enjoyed anything so much as seeing those children digging coquina. I don't know if you know that about Sanibel Island, but there's coquina in the sand and in the water. You just pick them up by your hand and let it drain, and you have them. And then Kay's wife cooked a. a soup for us from that. And, and we you had the shells then. They're very colorful. I should have worn my coquina necklace today. But anyway, it was it was really fun. And then Kay took us to Japan for a month. Uh, and we had the most wonderful time there. We have all kinds of... Uh, uh, Pip, is that in the exhibit? The shells? It is, yeah. We, we made a slideshow from that because Chuck found a, a book on uh, the crafts from the different prefectures. So the first we were with Kay in Kyoto, visiting all the uh, gardens and temples and everything. And then he, we, we set up an itinerary and we went to all the different prefectures in Japan to look at the craft that was a specialty of the prefecture and probably bring home some. We have a lot of things. That's in that, that slideshow. And um, Kay, in a very clever way, I, I'm not sure what year that was, but in a very clever way, he programmed a cell phone with his number in it. And if ever we had any problem when we were buying something, or shopping, we could call Kay. He didn't come with us on that. And we, we went around on little trains in Japan. It was, uh, you couldn't really tell. You had to count the number of stops because the train would stop at a station for maybe like one minute and you had to be, have your luggage at the door and get <laughs> off or you had to go to the next station. So I'm, I'm going to end now but I want to thank you all more than I know for being here and for loving Chuck so much. And I think that Don was really right that he loves you just as much as you love him. So anyway, thank you for coming.
Chuck's most frequent co-conspirator, Mary Wren Owen. Okay, we're at the end of our time together, our formal time at least. I should let you know that Chuck commonly used the metaphor, one slice at a time. If you were dealing with complicated problems, you solved them one slice at a time. Over the years of teaching with Chuck, it became my wife Patty's habit to send in a bunt cake. It met all the system requirements for the way it was produced, the way it was shipped, the way it was consumed, and the way it was cleaned up after. We would use the tinfoil for plates. It became the start of a dialogue at each systems workshop. We have two cakes today because we have a big crowd. They'll both be on the table with our refreshments after a few words from Dennis. I'll be short. I uh, just want to thank you all again for coming and to uh, celebrate the life and the legacy of Chuck. Uh, and the impact he had had on all of us and of the Institute of Design. I would also like to extend thanks uh, to the team that put this memorial together. Uh, Pip, Kay, VJ, uh, amazing job they did. Um, Tomoko and Martin, Martin Tomoko Ishikawa and Martin Saylor for the exhibit. And uh, the uh, events team, uh, Madden Osak and Rashan for putting the event together. And last but not least, Mary, who gave a lot of the, th the things that are in the exhibit. Uh, and I would like to end to talk about how Chuck's legacy will continue at IDE in many ways. Uh, the way number one, which has been for quite a while already, is the Charles Owen uh, Professorship and Chair, which was endowed by Rob Pugh, in, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, in 1999, with the specific goal to ensure that research in system thinking would continue at IDE. Uh, you have heard earlier from the two past holders, Quesado and Vijay, uh, and we are soon going to announce the next holder of the uh, professorship as well. Uh, second, the work will continue through the Chicago Design Labs, particularly through the Sustainable Solution Labs led by Professor Carlos Teixeira and by the Civic Incubator Lab uh, led by Chris Rudd, both areas that, Chris, uh, that Chuck's projects were really about, thinking about complex systems and having civic impact. Third, very appropriately for a professor who loved and was driven by technology, the exhibit you are seeing now is going to get also go onto the ID site on Google Arts and Culture digital repository. We have been invited to have a digital repository because of the Bauhaus, and we are able to be going to add the exhibit uh, there as well. And then, lastly, and probably most importantly as well is in the IIT archives. Uh, we had two students uh, work with Mary in December uh, to take all, with Mary gave all the material from Chuck that was very well organized, as you would expect. <laughs> and only took two days for those students to bring, take all the boxes, but it was a big truck. Uh, it is now in the archives, and we will catalog it over the summer with students. And therefore, people from around the world will be able to access and see what's in the archives and can access it. So with that, I would like to thank you all again all for coming. And please join us at the reception next to the exhibit uh, with family, friends, and colleagues, and both former and current students. Thank you. Thank you.